one of these days I will actually get proper like intro music. Do we have proper intro music? We do, but like it, it might be a secret of the trade, but I anyone listening, I don't actually play the intro music when we're recording this. Oh, right, of course. You just edit it on. Yeah. <laughs> one 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 day it will be a proper introduction and not just public domain music that I got. Well, if there's anyone out there who wants to write us some music, we'll credit you. We don't have oh, any I... money. <laughs> Julian Julie. will provide favors. <laughs> mm. yes. He's just staring at us. <laughs> it was in it was in your employment contract. I I thoroughly remember us writing that specifically in. Yep. Julian will provide favors. Clause, clause forty six, subsection three, paragraph five. It's right there. <laughs> you signed it. I'm a walking example of why you should always read the fine print. <laughs> read your terms and conditions. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone to We're Not Helpful, a podcast of uh, books, recommendations, our thoughts and opinions on them, and apparently Julian's sexual favours. <laughs> hey, 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 no one said they were sexual favours. You're implying oh, that. Okay, no. Just favours, like maybe someone needs some Ikea furniture built. He might, like uh, cleaning out the gutters. Oh, yeah. God. That Cleaning sounds horrible. Out... Oh, okay, let's move on. I'm Eloise. <laughs> Joining me, as always, is Julian and Brayton. How has your week been, guys? <laughs> Good. Nothing to complain about? Excellent. Um, So I thought uh, we could start You just off cut... with... didn't let Julian answer at all oh. about how his week was. You just started. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's fine. Maybe, maybe he's fine. had a horrible it's week. Absolute... No, no. <laughs> I... I... I don't want to tell you about my week now, so it's fine. Let's move on with the podcast. No, Julian, I'm sorry. How was your week, my darling? Are you are you good? Are you well? It was fine. Okay. He's got my the week prophecy. Fine. Let's move on. Okay. See, this is why I I I'm convinced I have undiagnosed ADHD because, like, I'm just thinking ahead to all of the other bits and pieces, and I just steamroll over everything. You got that mental checklist of going, all right, mm -hmm. I've I've asked a question. Yep. Next, yep. next, next bit onto the next segment. Right, you've got to you've got to add ask question tick, wait for response tick. Right, wait for response. That's I'll where you that that's time. where you're missing it. You didn't wait for response. All right. Are there, is there any business before I, I go to the next checkpoint then? No, I'm happy if you move on. All right. Well, I thought we would move on uh, quickly to some messages and things that we've received this week. So, Brayton, I know that you've got an email in the inbox. I received I a lovely message from one of our listeners, uh, Greg Wah from the Smart Enough to Know Better podcast. Hello, Greg. Uh, sent me this message last week. Um, dear unhelpful, unhelpful nears. So he's named us or he's named listeners. I'm not quite sure. Um, Ooh, we're a real show now. Yeah. You're a real show a when your, your fans have a name. Yes. Excellent. So I like that. Um, so he writes, I wanted to comment on the most important topic covered in episode 21, art versus artist, that of the portrayal of Dorian Gray in the 2003 Diesel Punk cinematic masterpiece, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> I think we might have a difference of opinion about what masterpiece is. I forgot Dorian Gray was even in that movie. Oh, well. Really? I, I he can... spends enough time with his shirt off. How could you forget that? I can hear Greg groaning from here, Brayton. He's very disappointed in you. He, okay. he goes on. When, yeah, continue. continue. Let's, let's okay. hear the whole context first. <laughs> All right. I can already hear your scoffs about the accolades I heap upon this movie, but please understand the movie is lifted far above its less than mediocre adaptation of the amazing comic series birthed into this world by the sheer will of Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. By one aspect only, a heavenly aspect, which one might call the extraordinary gentleman himself. I speak, of course, of Stuart Townsend's portrayal of Dorian Gray. Let us just say Townsend's portrayal of, of the character spoke to parts of myself I wasn't aware ran that deep. <laughs> True, accurate. Um, 
He exudes an aura of barely restrained sexual power that is quite intoxicating. To this day, I am not quite certain if I want to be this version of Dorian Gray or have him be my lover or both. Look, I think there are many characters out there that are very much like that. <laughs> I can very much relate. As Dorian himself says after being asked, what are you? By a wide-eyed henchman, he is running through with his sword after uh, regenerating from a fusillade of firepower from the same henchman's gun. I am complicated. <laughs> I would also watch the shit out of the movie The Picture of Dorian Bay, a queer-coded action film of manners where the best bangs might not be CGI. <laughs> I will never show him the Dorian. Gregoire, thank you. <laughs> Very much, Greg. Thoughts, everyone, on that particular uh, lovely message? Um, I got nothing to add except while you were reading, I looked up a picture of the cast, <clears throat> and I honestly have no memory of Dorian Gray in that movie. Even <laughs> Look, looking, do we have at any memory picture, of that film anyway? <laughs> it clearly didn't make as big an impression on me. Oh dear. Granted, it has probably been twenty years since I watched the movie. <laughs> maybe I should um, give it a rewatch. Maybe. Uh I spoke to Greg briefly afterwards as we were messaging back and forth. And um I, I think what he kind of wanted to bring up as well in terms of the actual topic of that particular episode is the fact that Stuart Townsend himself has sort of been a bit of a problematic character as well in the last few years because I believe that there was uh allegations of domestic violence. Brayton's looking that up to confirm that I I'm am. not just besmirching I... the name of, of an actor. Because this is, this is honestly the first I've heard about Stuart Townsend having any issues, but I'm not a Townsendite. Is can't that what his fans are called? Was... Oh, who knows? Uh, I can't recall if I who I was speaking to. Um, uh, it was a friend of mine. Oh, that's right. Um, who was I speaking to? Oh, there was Petrie. That's right. Um, we were talking the other day about the making of Lord of the Rings and how apparently it's only just come out recently um, in a television series that you can watch on SBS uh, regarding the making of the original trilogy about how problematic Townsend was on set. And it wasn't apparently the put out messaging in terms of um, uh that he was too young to play the character of Aragorn. Cause I don't know if anyone knows, but he was originally cast as Aragorn. They started filming. And then the line that was given was we realized he was too young for the character. No, it turns out there was a lot of other stuff going on. He was a very difficult actor to work with. He was very demanding. He didn't want to grow a beard. He uh, didn't want to like retake shoot like scenes. If he, if Peter Jackson wasn't satisfied. And I think if anyone's a fan of Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson knows he was a bit of a perfectionist and would retake scenes over and over again until he was happy, probably mm. to the point where maybe he didn't need to take that many shots of that particular scene. But the fact that Stuart was like, that's it. Perfect. Print it. Let's go. Yeah. Um. All I can see just on his Wikipedia page is just a one sentence thing that just says in 2019 Townsend was living in Santa Monica with his wife and two children and was arrested after a domestic dispute. Okay. So I don't know what that so, may or may not mean. There's no more something, information. Yeah. Something when, happened. When it comes but... to domestic disputes, if the police are called, one party will always be taken away that evening. Mm. That's, that's their standard practice. So it doesn't really mean anything in particular particularly mm. if it was released the next day. It just means that when the police arrive, they will take one party away and separate the two for the night. Yeah, yeah no, that's fair enough. Probably then. the so... safer option. Yes. So there's not really, like, yeah, it's hard to sort of go down that road of um, being upset with someone unless there's a mm. little bit more information about it. But it, 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 it's true that from the same topic, like um, when you like a particular actor, you're, you have an affinity with them or, or anyone like a public figure, yeah, it can be a little bit difficult to sort of marry up how you feel about them and their art compared to the type of person that they may or may not be in, in real yes. life. But that was a topic for last week. So if you do want to go back and listen to that episode, if you haven't already, please do go back and listen to yep. the previous episode, Art versus the Artist.
Yes. Um, Brayton, I believe you have received an email as well. I do. This is a very, yeah, similar train. It says, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, underrated, a masterpiece, this person's. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, all serious now. Uh, this one is from Isabella Har uh, almost said Harper, sorry. Isabella Harbour, who has written in previously. Um, and she hello says again, Isabella? Yes. Hello, Isabella. Uh, she has said, Hi, not helpful people. I was recently oh sorry, oh subject line, I'm afraid you've been helpful. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, this we is going to be bad. Yep. We we failed by not failing. Okay. <laughs> then have we really failed? Mm, this is mm. one of those logic questions that will make yeah. robots' heads explode. Yes. This is find out which one of us is a robot. Okay. Um. So, yeah, she says, hi, not helpful people. I was recently in earshot of someone exclaiming that some podcast had changed their life, and just as I started to roll my eyes, I thought, Oh dear, we're not helpful has actually changed my life. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, <laughs> yes. Since starting to listen to your show, I have deleted all of my all of the social media apps on my phone. I have resurrected my membership at my local library and have read actual books printed on paper. Our choice of books seems very different, so at the risk of you questioning my taste, some books I have read recently include The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Uh, second time, quite possibly my favorite book. I have heard of that book. I have not read it myself, but I do hear it is fantastic. Yeah, it's one of those. It's always on like some top 100 pretty, list. So. And I'm pretty sure it's on some high school curriculums. Hmm. Or at least it was many years ago when my younger brothers were going through high school. I'm pretty sure they had to read it. This would have been mid-2000s-ish. Um, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Guernsey. No, oh, excellent. I love that book. That oh, is such a great know it? book. Yes. It... <laughs> I, I borrowed it once from my, uh, one of my best friends and it's such a great read and it's a unique read as well. So basically it's set just after World War II. Um, and there are a bunch of people corresponding via letters and the whole book is letters, so it's no narrative written down. It's all just you get everything from the letters that they write to each other. And it's a love story. And it's just, it's so beautiful. And once again, the movie adaptation did not do it justice because <laughs> it, 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 it was just a story. The movie was literally just a story where it's like mm. that, you know, you don't get that same uniqueness of the fact that they're corresponding via letters and that's how the story unfolds. So that it would have been very difficult to translate it any other way to film or television. So, yeah. And they cut out a whole bunch of really important stuff as well. I'm like, <laughs> but yes, beautiful book. I thoroughly agree with you. Okay. Uh, she says, that was one of a collection of books I pulled out of a street library in a failed effort at decluttering and the artist's way. I'm afraid I did very few of the exercises intended to make you an artist, so my status as a Philistine continues. <laughs> I also attempted to listen to the audio version of Moby Dick, but I really couldn't cope and didn't make it past Chapter 2. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> well, seems... Isabella, I'm proud of you for understanding that if you're not interested in a book, you're allowed to stop reading it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I think our legacy of this podcast, if anything, it's either we have turned people off or on of Moby Dick. Yeah. That's going to be And possibly down. The Great Gatsby. I'm oh, going to yeah. just read it again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seemed to me that Melville was trying to present Ishmael as an everyman by making him a bit lazy and dim-witted, while also trying to impress readers with his, Melville's, vocabulary by using big words. Oh, I just couldn't yeah. bring myself to hit play on chapter three. No, it's like he, he found a thesaurus and went, I'm going to use every word in this. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think you sh I think we should celebrate that you have officially created a life-changing podcast, so I'm off to have a gin and tonic. Cheers, Isabella. Hey. Good choice. Oh, good choice. Nice. Mm. Uh, I think we'll have to have gin and tonics next time we record just so we can all cheers. 
I don't drink alcohol, so I will just ah. have... To is tonic by itself a thing? Like, do people just drink tonic? Uh, I don't is know. Tonic Weirdos, water, maybe. You can yeah, like, if you wanted to. Uh, is, it, is tonic water different to soda water? I don't know. It's it's all it's all spicy water to me. <laughs> There's <laughs> only one way to find out, Brayton. All right. I will... Go drink it and report back. Now? Like, do yeah. I pause recording? I'd have no. to go, I'd have to run down to the shops quickly. Oh wait, okay. All the shops are closed this time of night. Yeah, <laughs> I will report back next time if I remember, which I won't. Excellent. Um, speaking of the Great Gatsby, I think you'll all be pleased to know, and everyone out there, that I have now read the Great Gatsby. Boo! <laughs> Get off the stage. <laughs> So, Julian's trying to hold his rage back. <laughs> I I will not give any opinions because I think we no. do need to have mm. a whole. I I feel like we've been promising something. Hey, so you know maybe what? maybe next episode we make it a Great Gatsby. Uh, you know what I uh, I really you'd have to give me time to reread. Re 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 all yeah. right, all right. I we'll, think we both okay. need to. I we'll think we, Julian the, okay. and I need to make that horrible decision to reread it. <laughs> It's or really... maybe I'll just watch the Leonardo DiCaprio film. Yeah. <laughs> That's what most high school students do, right? The one yes. thing. No, they don't even bother to do that. Most oh, of them. All man. right, we'll put, we'll put that on the back burner then and give you guys time to decide if you want to reread it beforehand. Oh. I don't want to, but I will if I have to. Have it's to. not. It's not. Maybe a very we'll get the audio books. Book. Like if yeah, we get, get the, the audio, audio books, books. I'll just zone out. Thank you. <laughs> if... Just read Wikipedia. Uh, listen to it. Like, oh god, they're at a party again. Oh. Um, but the one thing I will say, and this opinion is also backed up by several opinions I saw on the internet, so you know it's valid. Oh, then we know it's true then. Yeah. I really think making high school kids read The Great Gatsby is a mistake. Oh, 100 percent Because not because it's a bad book or anything like that. I yes, think it's it because is. okay. <laughs> <laughs> just let him say his opinion julie because i think <laughs> the, the story and the characters the things the characters go through you can relate to much more as an adult and gone through maybe similar experiences than you would be as a 15 16 year old teenager and you know what you did say that to us the other day and that's what mm -hmm. intrigued me to think maybe i really should reread it and maybe if i can see if i can find the review i wrote of it when i was 15 because it was very I mean, silly. Sadly, you could apply that to the majority of the prescribed mm. texts for, for high school. Yeah, like I'm not going to, I'll save my opinions of it, but I will say undeniably it is a very well-written book. And I think, Julian, you said F. Scott Fitzgerald was a great writer. But I think you said was, it was just the character. Oh, absolutely. No, no argument he, there. Mm. That he wasn't a fantastic writer. It's mm. just... I think we. I think also it, it resonates time. more with an American audience. It's a very yeah. American book. Absolutely, mm -hmm. a very American book, and definitely speaks to America um, just before the Great Depression and mm. that whole thing. Yeah. But anyway, we will put a pin in that. Mm -hmm. Give you guys can decide if you want to reread it or not. But I think we do need to have an episode around it since you guys have talked about your hatred of that book so much. <laughs> And now Definitely. I have actually read it. <laughs> Even if I reread it and love it, you know I'm going to say I hate it because Absolutely. I can't. I can't admit I was wrong. <laughs> no, of course you can't. You're just going to play. Point, I'm too far in. Yeah, you're just going to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, before we move on to the uh, specific topic of tonight, did we want to go around the room and talk about what we've been reading this week? Admittedly, I don't have much to say because I'm still reading Thursday Murder Club um, and Brayton's already mentioned Great Gatsby. Julian, have you read anything new that you'd like um, to talk about this week? Not not new. Um, I've been going through a bit of a struggle myself lately mentally, so I've gone back to an old favourite that is is one of my comfort books, which is Eleven... Um, no, nope. 112263, which is the Stephen King novel about time travel and trying to stop the murder of Kennedy. So, oh. wonderful book. Um, definitely not one of his horrors, but that is, is something I read every now and then as a bit of a comfort moment, even though it's very long. <laughs> well, 
it sounds like you need a bit of comfort for a little while in any case. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. There's no rule that says you can't reread a book. Like some people out there think like read a book once, that's it, put it on the shelf, never touch it again. I'm one of those people where... people won't buy a book. Why would you buy a book once yeah. you've read it? It's done. Yeah. Well, it's fair enough like if you want to get books from the library if you don't want to buy it fine yeah. or you know buy them secondhand and then return them secondhand to the another secondhand shop or something uh i think if i was to never reread a book like i wouldn't have read lord of the rings four times <laughs> so <laughs> um shall we move on to tonight's topic then this yes. is uh, your idea brayton following on slightly from last week's topic yes actually. i think it links in very well tonight i wanted to discuss with you guys about the concept of death of the author. Now, now I, had... I find this really interesting because, mm. like, I have never really understood what that concept means. So I would love you to talk us through this. Okay. This week. So it, it does not mean a literal death. Let's get that out of the way. No, no. It doesn't? <laughs> so, oh, oh, no, no you uh, mean we're not supposed to go out and kill the here? authors once we've read their books? Oh, all, all my I'm preparation. Gonna, I'm going to... I'm going to need some legal money. <laughs> All right. All right. Brayton, pay the man. All right. Eloise, can I borrow some money? Sure. Excellent. You covered, right. Julian. Excellent. Cool. All right. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the death of the author is a very complicated topic that has been discussed ad nauseum for a long, long time in literary circles. But I'm trying, I'm, going to try and break it down to its simplest like surface level version of it tonight because quite frankly none of us have the quality Eloise is almost dying on her water bottle <laughs> oh that's going on TikTok Everyone, please check out the YouTube video of that moment because... Death of a podcaster. Oh, it's the next that's, level of death of the it. author. Oh, my God. I just... I just Never thought, let it okay. be said, Eloise won't suffer for her art. Jesus. I put myself on mute because I've been having a bit of a cough and I went to try and clear my throat and drink some water and, of course, it went all over me. Oh, I'm glad I'm wearing a t-shirt over the top of my nighty. <laughs> oh, ow. Okay. All right. Sorry. Continue. Cut there all of that out. <laughs> no. 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 Damn it. All of it no. stays. It's, it has it's, to. It's staying. It's definitely <laughs> staying. All right. So death of the author. So as I was saying, I'm going to keep it very surface level, but if you really want to, we can go into real depths of discussion about this as people have, and of course, as the title of the show says, none of us have the qualifications to actually have those discussions. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Julian, he's got an English teaching degree, maybe. Probably the most qualified out of all of us to discuss, discuss it. <laughs> My time. Finally. <laughs> okay, but Death of the Author, it was first introduced by French philosopher Roland Barth Barthes in his essay, The Death of the Author. In 1967, it was first published. And very brief summary of it is essentially the idea that the meaning of a text is not determined by the author's intention, but rather the reader's interpretation. <laughs> so to put that in a very simple context, it is the, the curtains of blue example that we always hear from English uh, teachers and English students in English class. It's the curtains were blue because of the main character's uh, depression and that his curtains were a symbol of his struggles and his depression. And then you ask the author, why were the curtains blue? And the author's like, I like the colour blue. Mm. So does the fact that the author says the curtains were blue just because I like blue completely negate another person's reading of any kind of symbolism or meaning into that? So essentially, yes. who is? There you go. Done. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah, so, thank you for so, joining us tonight. We've yeah. solved. <laughs> no. We've solved a solved a fifty sixty year old debate right there. It's so, funny so, actually yeah. because I 
you get that a lot in art as well. Um, oh, yeah, this applies not just in literature, in music, art, yeah. anything. I always found art in high school very frustrating because part of doing art as a subject meant that if you uh, did, like, a specific piece for a particular unit, uh, or at least my experience was, you had to give a meaning behind your piece. And I remember, um, like, being marked down and I used the example because apparently the color, I liked the color blue wasn't good enough for my teacher. So <laughs> I had to come up with some fart ass explanation mm. that was just absolute bullshit to, in order to get a better mark. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, if it's the teacher I'm thinking of, she was batshit insane. So it is, it is the teacher wasn't you're thinking of. a good of, enough Julie? reason for her. <laughs> <laughs> mm. If anyone's just tuning in, Julian and Eloise went to the same high school. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Julian was two years above me, so didn't actually see. know each other until no, we, met at we uni, didn't. Right. We met at university. Yeah. Quite, but we like had friends in the same sort of circle, so it was we were kind of like, mm. you know, I dated one of your in. close friends, didn't I? She was one of your close friends, or yes. a friend of yours? Yeah. She, yeah, well, not close, but like, yes, you did date one of my friends from mm. high school, so yes. <laughs> um. Cool. I've I've found this really interesting because obviously you do get so much interpretation from reading something where you might read into particular characters or particular aspects of those characters that the author might not necessarily um, had intended. And I mm. think the author's reaction to it as well is really interesting, whether or not they're, they're going to lean into what their fans say, um, and, or say, no, you're completely wrong and you're getting it wrong. Um, I'm trying to think, does George R. R. Martin have any kind of, cause he's been very critical of, um, of House of the Dragon recently saying that they they didn't do certain things and they've changed certain things. And I don't know if that's the same thing really, because there's license, artistic yeah. license to produce something no, in a I different think, medium. I think it definitely overlaps because you have to think that in someone else is adapting your work. So therefore certain liberties will have to be taken. You cannot have a one-to-one -one adaption of book to screen. Mm. It's just impossible. Um, and then the question is, how much say should the author then have over that? Like, should a showrunner, if they're House of the Dragon, for example, if they say, hey, George, we want to make this change, should the author have the right to just go, no, you cannot change my work? Yeah. Or is it the thing of when the <clears throat> author has sold the rights or even just published the book and put it out into the world, do they then have any right to shut down anyone's interpretation of their work that does not align with what they intended when they wrote it. Once it's, they sign over the rights of the book to a, a, a film or a TV show, then it's up to the showrunners to do what they will with the source material, unless the author mm. has written into it any form of creative control. Um, Stephen King generally signs away all creative control and says, do what you want with it. It's yours now. Um, whereas I know JK Rowling was quite, hands-on with the harry potter films mm. um, and other authors will be but it it depends on what the author wants to do in that case well that's that's an example jk rowling is brought up a lot and i know we talked about her last last episode as well um but the revelation that dumbledore is gay mm. which came out after i believe it came out after all seven books had been published many years after yes. and it is the thing of and, it's, and forgive me, but it has been a long time since I've read the books. But I believe it's... Can you hear that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is all staying in too. No, cut that out. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. Hang so, on. I'm, I'll just mute. Yeah. So uh, J.K. Rowling came out after the book's... Yeah, I think it was many years after the books had been published, she came out and said that Dumbledore was gay. And I think it's been a long time since I've read the book, so I might be misremembering, but I think it would be very hard to come to that conclusion on your own, just given what is in the books. 
It's funny, like I have spoken to a number of people like in the queer community, I have a number of queer friends um, who have all said there is not one thing in those books. And I also remember having read it myself, thinking there is not one inkling in those books to say that Dumbledore is gay. Um, And like on the one hand, at the time when she said that, People were all very, oh, that's so great that she had, Mm. like, such an inclusive character. But it's just like, or maybe you could have actually written him like that so that people were represented instead of trying to shoehorn an idea into canon after the fact. And I know that maybe it had something to do with when they were written at the time, it was hard to try and get that type of representation into, into certain books because of the fear of it not... Uh, being not being published but not being received well perhaps in a larger community compared to what those books ended up becoming because obviously as we have discussed before huge phenomena multi-billion dollar industry Um, the same can be said with the fact that that she says oh well Hermione is a person of color because of the fact that they cast a person of color now when they do the cursed child on stage and then she puts it back on the audience saying well that's just on you for not reading her that way it's like no you could have described her that way like just open endingly saying it oh yeah of course she is you Hmm. just didn't discover that I'm like like, nah that's like and that was a question that was brought up as I was kind of looking into this. It's going, how much of that, that may have been in her head, but yeah. then is the onus on her to put that out there rather than I, and then as, I guess, as an author, think in my head, I imagine this character as Dumbledore, for example, I imagine Dumbledore, he was gay, mm. but having written the books, his sexuality really is not important to this story. It doesn't need to be mentioned. But in my head, he's gay. Mm. And then as an author, then, if I say, oh, by the way, Dumbledore's gay, and then everyone says, well, you didn't write that in there, it's how much pushback should an author give of going, no, in my head, he is, if you didn't read that, that's on you. Does that invalidate the audience? And then going, well, I didn't read it that way, but it doesn't change the story and doesn't change Mm. my feelings towards the character. I think if an author specifically wants a character to appear a certain way, then it's on the author to put that into the writing. Mm. Um, You can picture a character as this or that or whatever in your head, but if you want the audience to explicitly take that meaning, then it's on you as an author to put that meaning into the text. Um, If it has no bearing on the text itself and you feel no need to and the audience doesn't pick up on it, that's no one's fault. Um, but you then you as an author can't go and blame the audience for misreading either, mm. I think. Yeah. But also uh, specifically, if we're going to talk about Dumbledore, specifically it was his relationship with Grindelwald that was supposed to be like this, you know, part of his history and it was supposed to be part of why he behaved the way he did and why that became such like like such mythos so to say Mm. for her to say oh like I just didn't write it in because it wasn't specific like it wasn't specific to the story it's like well it kind of was like it was important but we didn't no one read it that way no one was clued in that that's what was going on between those two characters and maybe look I could be wrong. Maybe there are some people out there who did assume that or or fantasized that maybe that's what it was or hoped that maybe that's what it well, was. Well, look, how many we you know how many characters have been shipped together in fandoms across the <laughs> internet? True, lots. If so there many, are two I mean... two characters together in a show that have yeah. any kind of friendly relationship, you know it's out there. I mean, there's like, there's Sherlock and Watson from the yep. modern day Sherlock series. There is Merlin and Arthur from the Merlin mm. series. There's um, Destiel from Supernatural. Um, like there are a lot of characters where it, it is the fandom sort of putting that coding onto them when that might not necessarily be what they are. And let I me, think... 
sorry, oh. let me just while I remember. No, finish your mm. point. I was going to say, like again, I'm I'm going to I'm going to talk about good omens. Like I feel I like knew, the I one... knew you were. I was <laughs> trying to stop you. <laughs> I feel like the one couple character that has been shipped because it it was coded into them, but wasn't necessarily explicit, and then turns out to be canon that they are like you know, in love with each other would be the characters of Crowley and Aziraphale. And funnily enough, I am actually rereading Good Omens at the moment. I'm reading it to my son at night and reading it from the lens of trying to sort of pass through what is in the book compared to what I have now got in my head from my many hours of being in the fandom. <laughs> it it certainly is not explicit. But then again, None of the characters really are explicit in any relationships except for Anathema and, and um, Newt because it's prophesized that they need to come together and it's implied that Madame Tracy and Shad will end up together as well. But, yeah, with Crowley and Aziraphale, it's, I don't know, they're ethereal beings so you can't really apply the same human character traits to them but there definitely is like a, a closeness to them when you read between the lines that a lot of people over the last 40 years have picked up on and made more explicit in you know fandom writings and whatnot um, and uh, he who shall not be named <laughs> then Voldemort. Encompassed that, yes, Voldemort, <laughs> <laughs> encompassed it into the show. Um, so, like, I can see how, uh, and funnily enough, th that particular author as well has talked very much to death of the author. And it, it is funny about how he has explicitly told the fandom, whatever you think, whatever you interpret onto these characters is your personal headcanon and therefore you are right. Don't ask me to tell, to confirm. I'm not going to get into the middle of you having arguments or saying yes or no. What you see in the show is canon or in the book is canon, but what you interpret it as is true to you and therefore just as valid. And I think that that was like, again, why well, I'm heartbroken because he was always so... Um, forthcoming with with the fandom and was so generous towards them mm. in when it came to his writing and he says that about all of his stories as well um in relation to jk rowling i don't know if it's different for the fact that she's the one that then says after the fact that um this is how it is yeah. And and I think that does speak to her pushing back against death of the author because she's still trying to control the narrative of her stories when a lot of other people have interpreted different ways. Mm. And that's um, really the heart of the question is how much control should mm. an author maintain of their world once it is out into mm. the world, into the hands of the readers? I was suddenly thinking as well because uh, from Greg's message uh, talking about League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, mm. Alan Moore, Alan Moore famously hates every single adaptation yep. that has ever been made of his work. And I, look, I'm, I'm going to argue that the, the the television series of Watchmen is probably some of the most extraordinary television ever made and it's a shame that he didn't like it because it was great. But, I mean, <laughs> it's it's par for the course he hates yes. every adaption oh, yeah i'm pretty sure so, his name is not on any of the films yeah he he basically refused to allow his name to be in a lot i don't of even think stuff. he got paid uh, if, I, if i'm remembering if i'm remembering correctly i read something i think it was when watchman got adapted he he forgo any payment and just gave it all to i think dave gibson who illustrated it okay fair enough i think he just doesn't want anything to do with it at yeah. all and he's so scathing so mm, yeah. he's definitely like very much if you're gonna do it you have to do it right <laughs> and <laughs> but no in one's his, gonna do in it his right. mind yeah in his mind you can't do it right <laughs> no in which case why does he let the rights go in the first place or is it a bit probably more a publish publisher thing yeah, i suppose i, guess I don't, it's I don't know how graphic it all, novels i don't know how it works i don't know how much of it is his control or in, in his control, I should say. Because mm. if it was in his control, I think he would say no to everything and we never would got 
League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Watchmen, V for Vendetta. Mm. That would just, which are all yeah. perfectly fine. Well, maybe not League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but like uh, according to that one person, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Um, <laughs> but admittedly, I've not read the graphic novels, so I can't. Not me either. Like, I've not. I can't compare them. Maybe I would be more angry if I had read them first. Hmm. Um. So I was going to say on the inverse of that. Hmm. Uh, John Green, do you know John Green, the author? He wrote A Fault in Our Stars. No. Oh, I've, yes. Oh. No, the, that's the one. Is that the one where there's like two, the, there's like a guy and a girl and they're teenagers, but they both got some kind of autoimmune yeah. disease? Yes. Mm-hmm. One of, one of them together. is in remission and one yeah. of them has terminal cancer. Um, yes. I have not read the book, but um, the book Pressing is film. entirely about essentially this concept death of the author. Um, mm. I will spoil what I read on Wikipedia for you. So if you want to read the book, yeah. skip ahead. But essentially her favorite book, um, she has a favorite book and they use like her make a wish, wish to travel to Amsterdam to meet the author of the book. Ah, oh, never the, meet your heroes. Because <laughs> mm, the book ends ambiguously. Oh, and she okay. wants to know what happens to these characters afterwards. Mm. So she goes and meets the author and asks what happens. And the author is essentially nothing happens. They're fictional characters in a fictional world that I created. Nothing happens. Once the story ends, it ends. And she's like, no, has to, has to, something has to have happened. And can I just say, Dick mm. move. Someone's oh yeah. Someone's absolutely. going to make a wish. And you're like, you're an idiot. That, absolutely. Just absolutely. <laughs> it's like, lie <laughs> yep but the funny thing is that apparently uh, maybe i should read the book apparently it's quite good um mm. but apparently he feels quite bad about how he responded to them and later on oh, actu- well, the... <laughs> actually writes an ending okay but by the time it gets to her she doesn't care anymore she doesn't want to know oh no because it's kind of been spoiled already so that's a perfect example right there of the author going like no i'm done like this story is done and the mm. funny thing the funny thing is a fault in our stars also ends on an ambiguous ending we oh, don't know if she beats her cancer or not and john green has also said like that's what i wrote that's the end of it but he had a i think he tweeted out something in the vein of once once a book is out um hold on let me try and find it Once a book is out, that book belongs to the readers. It's Mm. no longer the authors, it's the readers. And he has actually encouraged like whatever, and the same thing I think what you were saying before is whatever you think happened is fine. Mm. You can imagine a happy ending, a sad ending, no ending. That is absolutely fine. And it is not for me to tell you how it ended. Because my job as an author is I've written this story. I've written it A to B, it's ended. What happens around that before after is entirely on the reader and there is no right or wrong answer to that once it is out into the world. That's really interesting, actually. And I I think that I think it really is the the job of the author of any author out there to understand that if you're going to write something that one, not everyone's going to like it. Two, not everyone's going to interpret it the way you meant it to be interpreted. And three, that's not a critique on your writing because, you know, 8 billion people on the planet, we all can't have the same opinions or (laughs) thoughts about how things work. So I think it's a really healthy thing that if you're going to write something, to know that there's going to be people out there who's going to take that and create something new from it. And I think that's what's really powerful about any kind of art in that it means that you're you're inspiring other people to make more art. Yeah. And it that becomes art in itself in that it it branches out and mm. becomes something new. I think this is where uh, your beloved fan fiction community <laughs> comes into it because it does. <laughs> Obviously, the characters inspire new stories mm. with those characters. And sometimes I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of fan fiction may actually like fill in the gaps. It, yeah. 
So, uh, and it's not just obviously in Good Omens, but like so many other fan fiction communities out there. And like, I have seen it where someone writes something and then someone else takes what they've written and then they create a new scene from that. Mm. And then someone else does a piece of artwork and then someone creates a comic from that artwork and it cascades. And it's just, it is actually quite beautiful. I I admittedly had an experience of that myself recently. <laughs> where, I, saw, I saw your post. Ah, uh, yes. I wrote a very silly thing on Tumblr um, where I imagined a scene as a joke of, uh, hang on, let me see if I can actually find the, um, uh, what I wrote. <laughs> well, while you're finding that, Julian, find <laughs> can hmm. I ask, as an English teacher, how much do you encourage different interpretations of a text when you're teaching a text? We always encourage the kids to explore what they think something might mean or what, what meaning they take away from something. Because the way you're raised, everyone around you, your society or your culture um, raises you to interpret things a certain way. So you're going to take the meaning, your own inherent meaning from something, from the way you're raised, you're going to explore something this way, that way or the other. Um, but also to understand what the author may have been trying to say as well. So it's all about perspectives that are trying to be creative, but also perspectives of the reader and, and how you come to that meaning as well. Mm. <clears throat> so it's all about looking from both angles, understanding that sometimes the author really is just trying to tell you a story, but you're going to inherently take meaning from that because of who you are as a person. Do you think that authors can subconsciously insert things? Like Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I saw something once where someone was trying to argue that the theme of a book is something you should have in your head before you write, before you even put pen to paper, whereas someone else is arguing that the theme develops organically as you're writing and maybe you don't know what that's going to be. So I guess it's that idea of how much of that, symbolism interpretation needs to be in or do you think there's authors out there that have that symbolism intentionally put in and how much of it is accidental just as they write i think it falls on either way i think there are authors that set out to write a very specific message in their books and i think there are authors who tell you a story but because of who they are as a person that automatically comes through <laughs> excuse me um to use Stephen King as a perfect example, way back in the late 70s, he wrote a novel called The Dead Zone. Now, if you've ever read it, there's very great much book. a... It is a great book, but there is really a, a subtext of the dangers of ultra-conservatism within that book. Mm. Not that Stephen King was attempting to put that in when he wrote it. However, what is it now, 40 or 50 years later, he's written a book called Holly, uh, which is very overtly mm. leftist, which is very much intended to put in there. And so we take that meaning from that. So I think it really depends on the author. I think some authors set out to make a point and to have the audience understand their themes and their their context. Mm. But I think some authors will just write a story and they want to tell you a story, but because of who they are culturally, societally, um, their own inherent experiences and, and raisings lead their story to read in a certain way. And you as a reader pick up on that subtext. So I think it falls in both categories. I, I don't think it's either one or the other. I think it depends on the style of mm. what person you are as an author and what you choose to do. Famously, um, I don't know if this is tangential or not, it's just a fun story. Jim Butcher, who wrote The Dresden Files, which we I think we talked a little bit about off uh off air, I guess we should say. Um, he was on a forum years ago arguing that it's not the idea that's bad, it's the author that's bad. And someone was trying mm. to argue the opposite, going like, no, sometimes there are bad ideas. And he said, okay, give me your worst idea and I'm going to make something good out of it. And he said, <laughs> all right, a story about Pokemon and the Lost Roman Legion. That's uh, a fantastic idea. <laughs> how is that bad? I know, that's that's what I said. I will give um, you all the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, he did go on to write that series. 
It's called the Codex Alaria series. There's six books in the series and they got very good reviews. Someone took that dare very seriously. <laughs> I'm yep. going to write another one. <laughs> yep. So he, yeah, he, he, he took that challenge and did very well with it. Mm. I don't know if that's related to all, but it's a fun, it's a fun story to tell. Amazing. I Eloise. found the thing that I had posted. All right. Um, let's, let's read your quirky thing. And that might be a, <laughs> might be a good thing to end end on i don't know if we've answered any questions but we've definitely had a discussion uh yes well basically <laughs> I, I, like every now and then on good omens I'll, po I'll post a good omen season three thought of the day and i wrote do you think we'll get a scene where aziraphale and crowley are in a pub together someone asks if he if aziraphale is friends with crowley um and aziraphale will de deliver the usual line of oh no we're not friends i don't even know him and then the camera will pan over to them and aziraphale is sitting on crowley's lap arms wrapped around his neck crowley's arms wrapped around his waist they'll stare at the person who asked the question he'll still back stare back looking confused and after a few awkward moments crowley will finally say you heard my boyfriend we don't know each other now jog on <laughs> So that was my very silly thing. And then someone made art of it. Someone, uh, her name is Kiritastic. Um, you can find her on Tumblr, Instagram, and Reddit. And she made a fantastic little comic. Uh, oh, I probably can't see if that. You, if you can send me a link, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, I'll send you. Well, you can just, like, go to my Instagram page, which is just my name. Send me a link. Send me a link to your Instagram right. page, and I'll put it I'll in the show notes. Excellent. So go and follow her, like, and subscribe her mm. if you like Good Omens fan art stuff because it was excellent and it was very yep. cute and it was exactly what I was thinking. And I was like, I can't believe you did this. This is amazing. <laughs> so that was one of my first experiences of the collaboration in the fandom, which was quite lovely. Well done. All right. Well, I think... Like I said before, this topic has been argued ad nauseum for decades now. Um, just to counter it, there is one thing of, um, like some people have agreed with Death of the Author's thing. Some people have said, nope, it's not. The main criticism is that you have to take what the author's intention and the context that the thing is produced in, into account. I think that's what you were saying before, Julian, that an mm. author will subconsciously or consciously put their own experiences, their own backgrounds into a text. And the critics of death of the author theory have said that these things have to be taken into account to fully understand a, a work of art, a text, whatever it may mm. be. That is kind of like the big critique of it. Uh, my, my thoughts on the matter basically is yeah. an artist creates this world and invites you into it and what you make of that world is up to you. What you leave with, what meaning you leave with is up to you. Um, except for uh, the police song, Every Breath You Take, where Sting is very actually quite explicit that that is not a romantic song, guys. Stop treating it <laughs> as a beautiful wedding song. He's told you time and time again, there's no alternate <laughs> reading there. As the author, he has told you, take his meaning yes. from it. I think because um. I think death of the author falls down when we can literally say for some things like that you interpreted it wrong. Seal apparently yes. has I come think there out. There is a, there is that case. Seal apparently <laughs> yeah. came out the other day to say um, he's not explaining what kiss by rose means and that he's sick of people <laughs> asking him. <laughs> so um, what was you the other can one? Figure out whatever you want from that. Ah, uh, um, you're beautiful by James Blunt is a misunderstood a lot and it's used in weddings. Yes. That's actually, yes. I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it beautiful. is. A, You're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it is a. I think it's actually about someone seeing someone and then not actually talking to them or making the connection. Mm. I think if I'm yes. remembering correctly. Sees her from afar and falls in love with her from afar, but never that's actually it. approaches her. That's it. Thank you. I knew it was something mm. like that. Um, it's not a wedding song. No, it's not. The chorus is "You're beautiful," but it's actually very tragic. <laughs> mm -hmm. sometimes um, there is overt meaning in art and we should listen to that but sometimes you are free to make your own interpretation yes mm. but it is knowing when to apply that is kind of where mm. death of the author is coming but there you you can literally people have written books one way or the other about it like we're not going to solve it in a one hour thing here 
No, but um, I think we've had some good thoughts about it. And it? I'm more than happy to continue. If people want more of these conversations, I am more than happy to do them. They are very interesting. Well, if you have any thoughts or opinions about Death of the Author, please do write in to us at nothelpfulpod at gmail.com. Well done. Yay. <laughs> and please don't kill any authors. No, no we, mean we are it not a... advocating for that at all. <laughs> do not do that. We are meaning it in a metaphorical sense, <laughs> not a literal sense. Yeah. Um, I will put some, if you want some resources, I will add in the show notes. Lindsay Ellis did a great video essay around that and actually talked to John Green. That's where I got a lot of that information from. Oh, okay. I don't think she purged her YouTube channel. I think all her old ones are still No, up. all of her old stuff is still on YouTube. And I think she's back on YouTube cool. now because she posted her very excellent thing about the Beatles and Yoko Ono. And if you don't know what I'm talking mm. about, go and look that up because it, yeah, like I, the, the lie that Yoko Ono split up the Beatles is still so prevalent <laughs> and she does an Paul amazing... Paul McCartney was very vocal on that too <laughs> yeah. recently, I think. Yeah. She does mm. an amazing deep dive video sort of mm. discussing why that lie became so prevalent. Um, and it's an excellent, excellent video. So yes. look up Lindsay Ellis on YouTube. I will link the Stephen video King, essay. Stephen King talked about it occasionally in his... Um, memoir slash instructional book on writing as well about making meaning and when it's explicit and what you take from it and very famously also said guys sometimes a story is just a story and that's okay sometimes mm -hmm. the curtains are just blue yeah. <laughs> well on and that there's note... nothing wrong with that yep i just <laughs> i just want to add something we okay. talked about james blunt's beautiful i got a whole new respect for that man a few years ago not a fan of all of his music. He's got a few good songs that I legitimately do enjoy. Um, but back in COVID-19 times, this was 2022, this was published, um, when Joe Rogan was blowing up about, uh -huh. you know, all his stuff. Um, the headline is, James Blunt jokingly threatens to release new music unless Spotify removes Joe Rogan's podcast. I, yeah, I do remember that. That <laughs> was great. I remember that. <laughs> I gained so much respect Brilliant. for that man with that. Amazing man. <laughs> well done. And well played. With, with that, take you out. Julian, play us out. Oh, is that Julian? <laughs> You're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all of the socials, and we will see you next week, everyone. Bye-bye. We're going to stop recording and you're just going to do that thing where everything is silent for a bit. <laughs> but, yep, I can see your faces. Brayton is God. <laughs> got to hit stop.